Good afternoon. Jean-Hervé already set the stage. Uh, so, we are kicking off the inaugural session with three guests, prestigious guests. Oh, we, I'll spare you the introductions because that's so known. Christine Lagarde, who has a, is a permanent member of the Cercle des Economies d'Aix-en-Provence after a I've not said after a career, you know, your career is not finished, but let's say within a brilliant career, she is now president of the Centru European Central Bank, Laurent Berger also, a, a, who's been re-elected, I did like Africa, so I want to say with an African score of, uh, of, of general secretary of the French trade union CFDT for four years, and then president of the European Council of uh, Trade Unions. So, you know, that is a function that you are very, very attached to. And we got to have a third guest participants to this round table. I don't know if we can see her. Yes, there she is. That's me. Here she is, Gail Smith. Hello. Thank you very much. You, you know, the rule is that you all speak your language. So thank you, Gail, for your presence. Now, uh, during the, the first Christine, Gail Smith and Laurent Berger, and then by an, int an introduction, but clearly I want to give you the floor rapidly. Uh, by an introduction, I'll say quick, quick words to kick off the debate. I found that uh, the title of the conference is beautiful. It's very positive. The title of our session is more uh, scary, as we say in English. What does the world risk? What are, you know, I mean, I'm sure you'll talk about the opportunities or the, uh, or the topics that could be mentioned and not just the risk. So before saying a few words, as I said, I want to define the rule of the games for discussion. You each have uh, seven to eight minutes to do the introduction, to inter we'll interact. For those of you who wish to take the floor, it's a bit complicated in a room where it's such crowded, uh, such crowded. So the instruction I got is to say, you go to the website of the Secretary Commission, you ask your question, and I'll try uh, not to censor the questions. I'll try to take them as they come. So, uh, you know. So you see, this is, uh, I want to say a few words about, uh, which are in line with the, uh, but possibly, I don't know if we have to say, uh, uh, the 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 separation between long term and short term, what, or short term long term. The, what strikes me is that when we think about short term, I would say, well, everything, almost everything, changed in a very short time, and it is the speed of change that is the installation of a new macroeconomic regime, which, in my opinion, uh, surprised me. But I'm not the only one, I'm sure. So a change of speed, uh, we went from a macroeconomic to another macroeconomic regime, you know, uh, not so long ago, we considered inflection was too low. You know, it was the, 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 the topic of central banks, you know, today inflation is somewhat uh, too high, and it is the topic of central banks. Second example, end of 2021, I remember when we looked uh, of the uh, pre forecast for 2022, in France, uh, in the Eurozone, we were four or five percent per year today it's divided by two the two shocks of course the pandemics which is not over and ukraine which started on february 24th so the two shocks are still here and uh, and they such that instead of us discussing the recovery and uh, and problems with the recovery which was the uh, uh, it was partly i mean a continuation of uh, to catch up basically post-COVID, even though COVID is not over. Well, today, basically, in this activity, we are pondering if not at the, just at the, the, the beginning of a recession in the US or in the world. I said, possibly, is it a question, new question? Third element uh, of change in what I call the macro regime, you know, you know, it, has, it is associated with, uh, but for 10 years, 15 years, we had a very low interest rate and today they increase rapidly faster in the u.s than in europe and uh, today well you know interest rates are somewhat uh, biting or you know are, are so it's stinging some borrowers and states so everything has changed 
And at the same time, when I talk about long term, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed when we look at the structural uh, cases when, uh, that we'll mention in the next three days. First comment on what nothing changed, inflation started before Ukraine. And, uh, and in 2021, there was already uh, reflections on that. And what I want to say about inflation is that the shock on the food stuff seems to me more damaging and striking for the world economy than the energy shock, even though both are important. When the price of petrol or oil increases, it's not good news for the consumers, but usually we don't die from that. But part of the world, part of Africa, and I'm referring to Egypt, to Maghreb countries, which suffer directly from the increase in uh, food co foodstuff cost. So the fragility of Fra Africa and the emerging countries, it used to be true, and it is still true. So, two second thing that didn't change, the discussion on fragmentation, globalization. I don't want to talk about deglobalization. It went too far, it's going too fast. But discussion on fragmentation was asked before the two impacts, uh, before the COVID and before the Ukraine crisis or war. It has been uh, somewhat exacerbated by this discussion and the, and the shocks, but with two topics. Two topics, fragmentation, uh, partial fragmentation of the economy, and uh, two, uh, two levels, first at the global level, and of course for us in Europe there is a discussion, and I don't know if we'll come back to that, but which is in a floating around what is going on in the Eurozone. Third element that uh, lead me to say that leads me to that nothing has changed. I think the shocks we've gone through in the last two years did not bring any improvements in what I call global governance. I didn't see uh, in the the G20 discussing this, the WHO afterwards, but not before. Uh, the United Nations blocked for the reasons you know. So. This issue of global governance, uh, you know, which we deal with every year and which we'll find again, you know, uh, next uh, the, the, the impacts which could have led us to uh, met the, to improve the situation. Well, for the time being, well, you know, and last uh, element uh, where we clearly at the border between the changes and what doesn't change, the two shocks I'm uh, discussing, we're discussing pandemics and, uh, and the Ukraine shock. Uh, well, uh, caused uh, 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 a rebound of uh, Europe. Europe is, uh, is uh, again, on energy, climate, uh, Europe, which is slowly thinking about this, shaping its own defense, uh, which has uh, problems of operating rules, unanimous, r the rule of unanimity, how to overcome that. So the problem is that well, this rebound could be, you know, uh, you know, could be just like a flash, you know. So clearly, we have to uh, maintain the European flame. I do hope, and uh, as an economist, uh, I never uh, mix my forecast and my feelings. Thank you, Christine. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Christian. And thank you in particular for uh, stepping in for Laurence Bourne, who was due to uh, step into this place. I'd like to congratulate Laurence, who has been promoted to General State for um, Europe. And I'm really glad that she's been given that job. And uh, she's also a member of the Secle des Economistes. I hope she will remain so. So what risks are the world facing? What a huge question to address. Well, in my job, I could speak to you about inflation, but there's a wonderful session in Amphitheater Number 3 on that specific subject, so I don't want to whip the carpet from under their feet. I could talk to you about the stability of prices and the European Central Bank's decision to bring inflation down to 2% in the medium term. However, I would recommend you to read an article in Les Articles today and also a letter from uh, uh, François Gallo, who is a member of the European Central Bank's uh, Council, a letter which he's written, which he sums up all of these different positions. I could also have talked to you about monetary policy in general and the need to uh, guarantee transmission. 
we are all thinking about these things night and day. And I'm not going to reveal all of our thoughts. Some of you may be reluctant. Perhaps you're looking for some scoops, but you will be disappointed. I could also try to talk to you about the risks around the world, because on top of the conflicts, the violence, not only in the Ukraine, let's not only focus on that single part of the world. There is a conflict all over the globe which ties in with the climatic crises, uh, calling into danger not only well-being, but also the subsistence of millions of individuals. I'm simply going to focus today on three subjects, which in my job are sometimes considered as parallel, perhaps, but they do have their importance when you're talking about monetary policy. This, these are transformations that Christian has just referred to, and Hervé also referred to them, and uh, they are fueling all of our debates. And I want to talk to you about the neo-globalization or the Rio-globalization, and then I intend to take a look at the digital revolution. And my third subject, the huge climatic threat facing all of us. So these are three major risks. But in the spirit of optimism that we've all embraced whilst preparing this conference, I would also like to identify some avenues that we could try to take to rise to those challenges. So the first subject which I'm going to talk about is this new age of globalization. I spent a lot of my time in globalized parts of the world when I was Minister for, for Commerce in France, when I worked for the IMF. Globalization is my playground, if you like. And it's with a lot of sadness that over many years I have seen uh, this uh, cycle fritter away, get to do diluted, only existing in uh, the final paragraph of the G20 communication is uh, you know, committing to permanently wanting to achieve a result. And then all of a sudden, a woman turned up. And uh, sorry me for stressing the fact that it's a woman who turned up and has achieved many, many things. So I don't know if Ian Guzzi is going to be involved in these meetings over the next few days. But thanks to her determination and her experience, Experience, she managed to get three parts of agreement in the World Trade Organization. I don't know whether she's actually managed to do it yet. I'm sure she'll be knuckling down to do it in terms of fishing, uh, drugs, licenses. A lot of progress has been made. However, during the pandemic years, world trade went down by 25%. Whereas we had uh, global trade, which was growing even quicker than uh, the GDP around the world was growing. We noted on that occasion, through the pandemic and the war in Ukraine, that we were shifting from what Larry Summers called just on time into just in case. And so that bottleneck when we depend on a small number of suppliers in terms of energy, for example, our business models were extremely vulnerable. I believe that given that the situation which has been brought to our notice over the past couple of years, we have evolved not via deglobalization. Some circuits are in place, certain models already exist, but they will be modified. And we will perhaps shift from what a long time was, use the offshoring, we will switch to friend shoring. So this was a proposal that was put through by Janet Allen a year ago, and that has been picked up by the Canadians. And it comprises not only in uh, shifting your production sites to external markets, but to do this with countries with which, or which provide a lot of insurance, the allied countries. I think that we will also shift from the current supply modes to friend shopping. So we've got friend shoring and friend shopping, which means diversifying your sources of supply and no longer being dependent on a single source of supply. Friend sharing then 
and I think Europe is very well placed for this, friend, friend sharing will enable us to have greater regionalization. Why do I say that Europe is well positioned here? Well, because Europe is the leading zone in the world, ahead of China, ahead of the States. It is the biggest area in the world to have an open economy in terms of volume of exchanges. Europe is the number one supplier of 80 countries around the world. We often forget that. And we are also beating, always beating our bry about Europe. But no, the reality of Europe is that we Europeans are the biggest provide, or service providers or suppliers of 80 countries around the world. So this rather broad microcosm is the perfect laboratory for French shoring, French shopping, and French sharing. We can do it. An extra avenue, which we can explore if products are circulating, uh, services are. There's uh, an area where there's a lack of determination among politics. Bruno Le Maire, my friend, will be here on Sunday. I hope he hears this message. You can pass it on from me. There's one field where we have to move forward, and that is the single capital market. We know that the bank union uh, will will not be completed in the year. There are too many risk elements. But when we're talking about capitals, the, the, the technical issues can be resolved. What we need, what is lacking, is political commitment to have in Europe a deep market, a cash liquid that will enable us to fund all kinds of innovations that exist on our continent. All of those who love the single market, thank you. I know that the national market authorities are not all on the same line because they're wondering what will happen to them if ever we have a European uh, market for capital. And the other subject I want to address is a risk whilst also being an opportunity. This is the digital revolution. During the pandemic, we noted there were people working from home, there was remote medical consultations, etc., etc. All of a sudden, we'd all become digital. And digitization has sped up uh, over the last couple of years. Services are being virtualized. We haven't all got 3D printers at home yet because that will go beyond services and will start producing. But the virtualization of services could in all likelihood breathe a fresh uh, a breath of fresh air into our economies by slowing down the cost of production and bring down inflation without weighing heavily on wages. Another advantage here of this the digital revolution is to combat the third point which I'm going to bring up, i.e. climate change. The digital section contributes 2% to greenhouse gases, 2%. If uh, we do things right, we'll be able to reduce uh, greenhouse, gas effect, uh, greenhouse gas production by 20%. So we really have to move forward as we uh, modify our energy mix. So what are the obstacles in our way? Most of you know, you come upon these articles every day. We do not have the uh, skills, the labor, the talents that we need to be in a more digital economy. 70% of businesses today in Europe say that they are not investing yet or not investing very much now because they don't have the talents and the skills in digital fields. That means that we have to have massive investment in training for all categories. We don't need to be the field's uh, medal winner for mathematics in all fields, but we do have to experience some transformations. But what can the ECB do in all of that? Well, the ECB is also um, conflicted with this the digital question in terms of payments, for example payments between uh, member states and between Europe and the rest of the world, we are investing, developing, improving where necessary. And there are quite a few of us asking that we uh, speed up. Second point, in the Euro system, with the 19 member states of the Eurozone, we have decided to move forward in 
terms of digital euros. Rather than have paper notes and metal coins, we are edging towards a digital euro whereby each of us not in the immediate future, but as time goes on, as digitization of our economy unfurls, we will soon have digital money, a digital currency, which will enable us to maintain sovereignty, which is absolutely basic and essential in our economies and in the European zone. But it will also mean that we'll be able to have some kind of benchmark. Just imagine the day when a certain number of currencies, the private, so-called private currencies, they need to have a reference point and they want to use a traditional uh, currency. We have to make sure that, our, uh, that it is a digital one. So we are heading towards this digital revolution and it is happening as we speak. The third thing I wanted to talk about, that's the biggest challenge of the century, i.e. climate change. By 2030, 120 million people who are impoverished today will suffer from drought, flood, and extreme heat. We aren't the only ones to be suffering from extreme heat here today. No, the situation is much more serious and some lives are endangered. Second point, that's the fight against uh, global warming. It will enable us to reinforce our independency in terms of energy and security as well. So you're going to say, well, what is the European Central Bank doing in all of that? Because everything pertaining to climate change and the commitments of the Paris Agreement, that depends on the governments. No, well, yes, of course, it does depend on the governments, but we also have a, play, a role to play. And at the European Central Bank, in the entire Euro system, because we have uh, carried out a strategic review last year, climate change within the framework of our mandate, in the role we have, in the tasks we have to perform, climate change is part and parcel of all that. And so we have built climate change into our macroeconomic model. We have started now, it was announced just a few days ago, we've started to green up our portfolio, both monetary and non-monetary, and we will require disclosure from all businesses if those um, shares are taken as collateral. And it's also what is going to be uh, necessary in terms of uh, scores, etc., from the uh, agencies. So everybody has their role, everyone has their mandate, and together we'll be able to combat this major uh, challenge. I know that a central bank of the scope of European has a role to play. We can perhaps uh, catalyze certain efforts. This afternoon we are going to be publishing the results of a test. I'm just going to look at the paper here so I get the figures right. We're talking about supervision, which is slightly separate from uh, the central bank activity, we are going to publish this afternoon the results of a prudential resistance test, test pertaining to the climate resistance of banks. And we note that three out of five banks have not put in place a climate resistance test, and only a small percentage of uh, banks uh, take into account climate conditions when deciding whether or not to give a loan. So this can be used as an encouragement for next time things be better so that the results are better next time. I'm not asking for uh, an increase in the capital ratios or anything like that. We just want to remind everybody that we all have and we all must be able to fight against this third threat which is hanging over our heads. I've got a few words of conclusion, but I'll just uh, spare you that and uh, hand the floor over. Thank you very much, Christine. We will have, I hope, plenty of time to talk. I'm having difficulty managing the clock here. This is my 22nd year at the event. There's always a lady somewhere. Oh, there she is, our timekeeper. Time I'm not saying this specifically for you, Christine, but she helps me manage time. I realized that I forgot to introduce uh, Mrs. Smith, who is online with us, and she is doing us a great honor of taking the floor. I'm sure we got you out of bed very, very early this morning, Mrs. Smith, given the time lag. Madame Smith is uh, at head of an NGO called WAN. 
One works a lot on issues of development, questions of poverty, illnesses, vaccines, etc. And uh, one played a big role during the pandemic. Uh, Mrs. Smith, uh, you have advised several American presidents, the Democratic ones, and I'm delighted to have you here today. And we are all looking forward to listening to you. Earlier on, I said a couple of words about Africa. And I imagine that you're very interested in that subject as well. I was talking about the explosion of the cost of raw materials and the impact on Africa. But it's down to you now to tell us uh, your message. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, to help you manage the time, if I could go too long, just send me some signal like this, and I will. I will cease talking. <laughs> and I wish I was there with you today. But let me just start by addressing a question that comes up a lot that I think is the backdrop to what we're talking about here today, which is, has globalization stalled? Has it failed? Where will it go? And I think my argument is that we haven't achieved globalization. We don't yet have a global economy. We've got partial globalization and, in essence, two global economies. Uh, one that's facing shocks but has a lot of resilience to fall back on and one that doesn't. And I think in terms of what we're looking at in the future, and this will be dire, but I'm also one who believes that we can always do something about problems. I think we are looking at increased division. I think we are looking at increased conflict. Uh, we've already seen the first increase in extreme poverty in 25 years, and I think there's more to come. Let me say a couple of reasons why I think that to be true. Probably no single event will shape the thinking of a lot of young people around the world in low income countries. And the fact that during a global pandemic, wealthy countries achieve vaccination rates over 70, over 70 percent, some to 75 percent. Low income countries are hovering at 14.5 percent. Wealthy countries had a six month lead on procuring vaccines, low-income countries were squeezed out of the market. What that says is that even when we're faced with a global threat that threatens literally every country on the planet, it doesn't play out either fairly or in the case of a pandemic, wisely from an epidemiological point of view. Now we're seeing a huge, massive food crisis sparked by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, that is much bigger than that of 2007 and 8, when we saw riots and demonstrations in 43 countries. What we're looking at now is low-income countries facing a debt crisis. The best functioning of those low and low-middle-income countries seeing declines in revenue and nothing to fall back on. So there's a real danger here, I think, and it's a danger that is rooted in whether we want to look at the global economy going forward in such a way that, as Christine rightly points out, we look at digitization, we look at climate change, but also, as you mentioned, we look at this issue of global governance and figure out whether there are some bold ideas we can put on the table and whether we can level the playing field. I point to five things I think we need to think about. Uh, the first is on the food crisis. The food crisis is bad, the fertilizer crisis is probably worse because that's the thing that's going to mean that production is going to go down in future years. Access to and demand for fertilizer is very uneven and it looks like we will see low and low middle income countries squeezed out of the market again. What can we do about that? Use what global governance we have to try to orchestrate the management of the fertilizer sector such that production does not fall precipitously in those countries that are the most at risk of falling off the map. Second is on special drawing rights. There was a bold and I think very wise decision taken that in the issuance of 650 million SDRs, wealthy countries would on pass up to $100 billion of their SDRs to countries that essentially can't print money, that could not undertake the trillions of dollars worth of stimulus programs that some of us were able to do during the pandemic. Great move. We are at 60 billion in those SDRs committed, but none of that funding has arrived yet. And we're two years into it. That's got to move very, very, very quickly. In the longer term, I point to three things. Uh, I work with a lot of young people in North America, in Europe, 
and in Africa. The good thing about that is they think about the next 50 or 60 years with a great boldness. The first thing I would throw out is reimagining the G20. It's an important body. It's a critically important body at this point in time. It's got a history and a pattern of talking about what to do about the global economy. And oh yes, then we need a special initiative for Africa. What we need to think about is how the G20 transforms into a body that is really looking at the entirety of the global economy and not that which is achieving great wealth and that which isn't as two separate entities. The second is to unlock the potential of the multilateral development banks. Critically important institutions, I think during the pandemic, it's fair to say that they didn't demonstrate a lot of agility or a lot of innovation. There's a lot of capital that can be leveraged there that needs to be unleashed and some modernization that is critical if they're gonna be as nimble as we need them to be. And the old models don't work when we're facing, as you rightly said in the introduction, crises that are accelerating at alarming speed. The third one, a little bit controversial, but hang with me. Christine rightly mentioned climate change. Uh, there is perhaps no greater threat hanging over our heads. The way that issue is unfolding though for poor countries, particularly in Africa, is that for understandable reasons, many countries, including the G7, have decided that they will not invest in fossil fuel projects. It makes total sense on the surface. At a practical level, what that means is that Africa cannot get financing to use natural gas as a transitional fuel between fossil fuels and renewables, where they have enormous potential, as much as 60% of the world's capacity in solar, but with 1% of installed capacity. So we're at a point now where, ironically, there are countries approaching Africa in need of natural gas, given what's happened with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But we've got a situation where using that as a transitional fuel, which would increase Africa's emissions from 3% of the global total to 3.5%, while simultaneously investing in that renewable capacity, could transform that continent and the market it offers to the world. Failure to do that sends a signal to the continent that we wish you luck in developing the first major solar factory on the planet because you can't use that natural gas. So I think looking at what the transitions are in these countries, leveling the playing field is the bottom line. I think we're looking at frightening levels of division politically and economically around the world and by the way within countries. The best thing we can do is take structural steps to level the playing field. And let me end it there and pass it back to you. Gail, thank you. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. And I, I guess that we will come back to some of, of your points in the debate. Uh, Laurent, à toi. Good afternoon. Thank you for this very kind invitation. Of course, it's a broad topic. Therefore, there will, uh, you know, two and a half days of uh, uh, we will try to narrow topics to the, in the good meaning of the word, going for shrinking from global to more precise or local vision. What is the world in the risk of? Well, uh, at least three things. First, not be able to have, to identify to make the good diagnostics. Things have improved. Let's face it. In the last uh, few years, so all thing is done. So uh, I think uh, it, it's, we've made headway. Second, it's this uh, to, to ask, at least in some part of the world, we should rethink the meaning. So what is the end purpose of what we're doing, of public action, of the common good, what we want to do together? What is the, the meaning? And there's a time dimension in this current period. I fear that we will sacrifice medium and long term to to the benefit of short term. The situation is so dire, there are so many emergen urgencies, so the easiest to solve would be the one with a rapid solution and leaving aside a certain number of uh, challenges. So my th the three main challenges I see, which are unavoidable and which, you know, and it concerns the whole world. First, the climatic challenge, of course, 
If there is a topic uh, where the globalization, deglobalization is insane, that's the one. You know, everybody faces the same problem. We all have to accept the fact that we've all made mistakes and we've all made had good solutions. But as we say, you know, when I said to sacrifice medium and long term, this one would be the topic of many discussions, debate, but not enough action. Second element, uh, which I think is essential, is that of inequalities. Of course, globalization enabled uh, millions of people to pull out of poverty, but it also created inequalities, polarization of wealth, and the feeling of abandonment of part of the Western working class population, and I'm talking about the lower middle class and uh, working class, and then the democratic challenge. You know, if uh, you know, the other day with uh, my colleagues from the trade unions in Europe, European trade unions, we counted the number of states in the world where you one could possibly criticize the government. Well, we observed that, in fact, uh, you know, every year the number drops. So this democratic, the democratic issue is essential if we want to overcome the, the two previous challenges. So what do we need? We need first uh, radical changes, radical orientations, you know, transformation of models. We need better regulations and negotiations or dialogue of democratic governance to uh, uh, weather the transition and uh, and the regulations governors that would make it possible to call to uh, overcome all the challenges economic challenges fair enough you know which is of course predominant in many decisions and the ecological the social ones and the democratic ones so when we look at the scope of what is possible well, without despairing at least there is one opportunity called europe and and i do believe that first because in crises that have just happened you know, uh, uh, Europe has, uh, is uh, kind of as renewed, uh, you know, this recovery. I mean, you know, when we don't agree with Europe, we say it, but let's admit that, especially when it came to the COVID crisis and even with what happened in, uh, which is happening in, in Ukraine, clearly, uh, you know, I'm not about the political level, but, you know, from the, in terms of European dynamics, but something is, is going on. But the, Europe should go further as a regulator in its ability to, uh, to reform internally, to do pro internal projects, which could make sense for globalization. We could have an impact on the content of globalization. I'm referring to preserving the social model based on what? Based on social protection. Uh, prote social protections, which may are different in different European countries, but uh, public actions, public services, which are worthy of the name. And I think it should also be uh, it should be demanding. Uh, there is a, a very uh, interesting subject, which I haven't been able to to uh, conclude in the, the French presidency. But, you know, uh, the directive on the uh, on the, the duty of vigilance, we have to be uh, have an impact on uh, global corporations by saying, OK, you got an economic imperative, we know it, but you got also an environmental and social uh, 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 obligation that you must comply with. And Europe should, uh, in a more and more complicated world and sometimes more dangerous world, to uh, communicate its communicate about its value I'm, uh, I'm talking about trade you know in the last 15 years we we argued on the trade agreements but we never uh, like the when there is a trade agreement is signed well uh, we will increase integrate mirror clauses the social issue and environmental dimension you know things are moving and uh, making it but each time we forget to talk about it so i think we we there is a sign of uh, uh, the, the, you know, we're despairing. So Europe has a central role to play. Things are uh, moving uh, well, but we have to go further when it comes to the environment challenge, going further for the carbon uh, tax by go overgoing the or the uh, economic and financial uh, challenges. Of course, there could be problems at the stage, but I don't believe that uh, the transition transformation should do. we should do will not put us in a difficulty. So how do we manage that? This is the point. Now, and I do believe what, uh, what this is what Gail was saying earlier on, there is a challenge of solidarity. Uh, for Europe has a solidarity uh, obligation, and especially through a green fund to deal with climate change. And let me take another uh, vision, uh, quite controversial, 
lots of discussion in our societies. Uh, you know, we often we ask the question wrongly on migration and so on and so forth, immigration, but we just had a beginning of what's going to happen if climate change is not controlled, is not mitigated. So if we don't help countries, third world countries, especially Africa, to deal with climate change, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll face a dire situation and we will have missed it. Now, I think there is an issue of uh, wealth sharing. This is a burning topic. And uh, again, I will uh, follow what with Christine Lagarde said, uh, you know, I'm not dealing with uh, current news. I'm not talking about inflation, uh, national draft laws, but at a global level, at a European level, and even at an economic level in, co in business, there is a, uh, 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 w the problem of uh, sharing the wealth, you know, that is decent salaries from work, and that raises the issue between, you know, the uh, income from uh, capital and work uh, re uh, re uh, income from work, and there is another challenge, which is that of this, uh, the the distribution of wealth. So, what did we do? We uh, fairly de uh, de dedicate to the common goods and investment needed for societies. You were talking about training and uh, education and competence. Well, the education is a key challenge in the world. And in Europe, in France, we have to say, OK, what what are the means we put into this? And at the initial level, it's the same thing, even though, of course, it is more difficult. So, And finally, when it comes to, the, to democracy, I think we should not underestimate this question. I'm amazed more and more people have a feeling that they, you know, they, they're no longer able to tackle the, 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 the challenges and that causes no, creates no future. So those transformation challenges are essential, you know, they call for radical choices and especially the climate change that each time there is a transformation, there will be many of them, they should be negotiated at all level, at all uh, and we should not forget the concrete life of where we work, where we live. When, if we miss that step, that step of uh, because we have to, f will be dealing. We have to deal with radical transformation changes. Well, if we miss the the negotiation, dialogue, and confrontation of ideas, to to uh, so that nobody will be uh, on the side left on the side of the road, we won't be able to do it, and then. We, we want, we'll have reasons not to be optimistic. So it's not a question of being optimistic or not. Ramshi used to say, you have to have the pessimism of intelligence and the optimism of action. I do believe that in the challenge of the world, we are at a crossroad when it comes to action. Thank you very much. I think all, of we've, all that we've heard is very uh, complimentary and everything seems to converge, of course. That's uh, something which I've been happy to note. I think we have to keep an eye on the what on our clocks here. I'm going to ask all three of you a couple of questions. These are questions which have been submitted. And I've got my own question to add to the list also, if I may. OK. Here we go. I've got four questions to put to you. The first one. Does technological, is te technological progress the main problem for the environment? Is technology a problem or a solution? I don't know if uh, either three of you would like to have a go at that one. There's, we've all talked about governance in Europe and around the world. And there's one question, which we're talking about the outlooks for the econo economy and uh, the environment, i.e. the different COP meetings. We're up to COP27 now. But above and beyond the COPs and the uh, IPCC reports, which always cause quite a stir, we have to talk about uh, this uh, question of sobriety, which has been mentioned of uh, using less energy. Gail's mentioned this. She talked about the notion that we should perhaps institutionalize the G20 a bit further. G20 is quite uh, tricky because Russia's sitting at the table as well, which makes it difficult to manage. But what can we do around the globe to move forward on these subjects? As Laurent has said, we're all in the same boat. 
So those are two of the questions. I might add one as well. Gail mentioned the question of reallocating uh, the SDRs. With uh, Jean Hervé and others in this room, we have been battling for Senegal to be at the top of the African uh, Confederation, and there are many countries, many countries around that table, and they're all concerned with this. We went to uh, see the French administration. The French are further ahead in the field than other countries. As Gail has said, it's uh, not moving forward. There is the debt management problem, and the African countries are reproaching us for having kicked the ball. I think it was the uh, French who got the ball rolling, but things are no longer moving anymore. What can we do? And as far as digital technologies are concerned, I've got a question for Christine. We're not going to talk about uh, monetary poli policy today. You, like the other central banks, you are going to launch a digital euro, like the Fed is going to uh, launch the digital dollar, and the Chinese are doing the same. So the question which I have for you is, when you talked about this for the first time, that must have been over a year ago, you said that it'll take five years. So do we have to wait for five years until we have a digital euro? Gail. The question which has been raised. You want me to start? OK. Um, let me take a, a couple of the things <clears throat> you said on on governance, because I think that's key to how you do things like move the SDRs forward. And the point was made about democracy. Certainly, I think in many of our countries, <clears throat> uh, there are big challenges to democracy. And one of the things we're facing is that the politics of the moment are counter to the interests of politicians to tell people the truth. The politics of the moment are such that sacrificing the medium and long term is the choice that politicians are making to focus on the short term. So, for example, uh, I remember on <clears throat> on vaccine production, I was uh, advising the Biden administration. Every country in the world came to us saying that they wanted a factory to produce mRNA vaccines. Every country in the world wants to now produce its PPE. As Christine pointed out, trade has gone backwards. Those kinds of trends are dangerous in the medium to the long term. In the short term, they're politically expedient. One of the things I think would make a big difference, I am not an economist, and, and I'm surrounded by many at this forum. I think the more economists can point to analyses that show the long term risks of certain policy decisions, but as importantly, the short, medium, and long-term benefits. There's some choices that are being made now that make sense in the heat of the political moment, but are unwise for the economic futures, not just of, of low-income countries, but certainly of the wealthiest countries. So I find it very useful, and it helps me make my arguments, when economists are putting forth analyses that allow you to say assertively, this will make a positive difference. That's number, that's number one. I think on global governance, um, we are seeing the lowest rate of confidence in global institutions that we've certainly seen in my lifetime. Uh, the counter to that is, is, I think, two things. One is accountability. There's a lot of data and evidence that, that shows that people who lack confidence in institutions, uh, that confidence increases with the transparency that allows for accountability. And I think that's something that citizens have to do as much as anybody else. But I think the more we've got the transparency, the more we can assert the accountability and rebuild governance. But I also think we've got to refresh a lot of these institutions. Uh, they were built a long time ago. We shouldn't abandon them wholly. But I do think we've got to reimagine them for the future. And those conversations need to start in earnest. There is some discussion already starting, for example, about the multilateral development banks. But we've got to move quickly to reimagine those, to make sure the representation is more equitable. Uh, I take your point on Russia being 
in the G20 and that making it difficult. My argument on the G20 is maybe it needs to be the G30. And maybe one of the ways you dilute Russia is that you change the discussion by having some other voices at the table. Um, I'm not going to touch the technology question because my answer is straight down the middle. I, I think it is a blessing and a curse. And our challenge is that it's moving faster than we are. So yeah, I will talk about technology and I would have the exact same answer has already been given. It's all a question of political commitment and human choices. Technology has led to ecological difficulties, but in my eyes, it's also the solution. It depends what you do with technology in what you invest. Madame Christine Lagarde said it would also depend on the investment conditions of the future. And we have to move towards more investment in the ecological transition. We have to invest in technology that will enable that. I I don't think that we're going that choices are not going to be forced upon humanity. I think men and women in the future will uh, be at the helm, will make decisions. And that's the whole issue rather than I think first of all you have to have that radical will to uh, not go smashing into that wall that's uh, up, uh, in front of us. As far as institutional, uh, international institutions are concerned, there are some that we can get a better grip on than others, such as Europe. I'm not saying we're completely in control of Europe. It's not easy, but that's where we have the biggest, the greatest scope. Yes, there is a lot of mistrust of uh, European institutions. The, the citizen doesn't really trust them. When I've attempt, assisted on conferen in conferences about the future of, of Europe, and there have been civilian panels there have been European, Euro MPs as well involved. And the optimism came from the civilians and their view of the future and their desire to create a development model that will be uh, less greedy in terms of, economic, uh, of ecological resources. I think we really have to get the debate going all over the place. Let's not let just a few players dis take all of the decisions. I really do believe that uh, democracy, comparing different points of view, finding uh, a middle ground, that that will help us to move forward. I'm not an international institution specialist, but I can just give you my feedback from my experience in Europe. OK, Christine, would you like to wrap up for us? Well, I agree 100% with what Robert Berger has just said. So Europe is not easy on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a bit laborious and it seems to be creeping forward in a disoriented, in a disorganized manner. However, we, uh, we, we can see that Europe does work and it is aiming for the common good within a very important part of the world. As far as technology is concerned, same as what Gail said. Um. She's a really good friend of mine, a really good friend, Gail. So it's a blessing and a curse. One of Einstein's colleagues said, I can work out all of the calculations and, and formula in the world, but I cannot understand the, the, man, the way man's mind works or man's madness. Let's get on to the G20 now. I agree when Gail said that today the G20 is possibly uh, very efficient and represents the world very well. However, we've got Africa, which is only represented by South Africa. The governance rules in the G20 are such that G20 finance, which is going to be held in Indonesia in a couple of days' time, will have around the table Russia. And no one wants to hear what Russia has to say. There are no internal governance rules that will manage that situation. Other institutions have found that, such as the, there are many which spring to mind. So I think we have to improve the G20 and they have to have the proper operating rules which make it possible to, to get together, 
and to exclude those who are not respecting or not playing by the rules. Okay, the SDRs, yes, we have to push the institutions. Some of them do that. That's their job. If a country is at 60 out of 100 billion that is supposed to be uh, sent to the developing countries, then you have to, you know, make them face their responsibilities. We can't say we're going to put 100 billion euros for exchanges with African countries and then just go home and, and not do it. You really have to play the game. Final question. I'd just like to have a quick thought for Chinzo Abe, who has just died shot down by an assassin. He was a member of the G20, someone I know knew very well. When you're talking about democracy, it also means respecting other people's point of view and uh, violence is not a solution to anything. And because you asked me about digital currency. Digital, the most advanced digital currency today, well, apart from a few tiny states, in the Bahamas, for example, the most advanced country, which is a pilot, is the Chinese, is the China. They began nine years ago with their, their cryptocurrency. They uh, have some pilot schemes. They are the most advanced, the second most advanced project is the European Union project, it's the Euro system. And it's not easy to run. There are 19 central banks around the table, we're all moving forward together. We have the most skilled workers who work together. And you're asking me if we're going to be ready five years after the announcements which we made in 2021. I have really high hopes that we will be. It's not final yet because the governor has to give the green light on the choice of technology, but we will uh, be there. And I think it is vital that we are ready. So we will continue to have uh, PayPal and uh, credit cards, Visa, Mastercard, and then if we if we don't uh, move move along, we will be really upset if we don't have our our digital currency. So I hope we'll we'll get it very soon. Thank you very much to all three of you. Gail, thank you very much for being with us remotely, and thank you for the two people on the stage here, and thank you for you in the audience for listening and for your questions.